Well, good evening, uh, Castle Hill Baptist Church. Uh, It's great uh, that you can uh, tune in again tonight. And a warm welcome to all those who are viewing, uh, who are not part of this uh, local congregation. Uh, We just want to extend our greeting to you and are thankful that you uh, can be uh, part of this to tune in and hear God's word. Uh, For those of you who have never met me, uh, my name is Nathan and I'm one of the pastors here at Castle Hill Baptist Church. So uh, it's great that you can tune in tonight to hear from God. Just before uh, we jump in, just an announcement. Next Sunday evening, we're going to be having another Q&A with the pastors. Uh, So that means if you have any questions, uh, please email them to the office or email them to the pastors. uh, Send us a text message, however you want to do it. But as um, as with... As previous times, we've had Q&A, you need to get them in by this Wednesday, by the Wednesday eve, uh, before Wednesday evening. Uh, some of you had questions, but you submitted them after Wednesday, and we had already recorded the Q&A, so we couldn't include them. So if you have a question, make sure that you send it in before this coming uh, Wednesday evening, and we'll do our best to address it next Sunday night. Well, tonight we are looking at Joshua chapter 4. Uh, last week, Pastor Ian preached on Joshua chapter 3, which was the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River uh, that Israel went through. Chapters 3 and 4 uh, are really one event. Uh, it is the same event that's going on here. Uh, it's just retold again. The crossing is retold again in chapter 4 here. Uh, So I could, in preaching this sermon, I could just retell the narrative of how Israel uh, crossed crossed the Jordan River. I could do that. But that's not the author's point for uh, repeating this story in in this next chapter. That's not why he does it. Why is he repeating himself? Why is he recounting this event again? Well, chapter 4 shows us the ongoing significance that the crossing of the Jordan is to have uh, for Israel. Now, with that in mind, I want you to, uh, to remember what the purpose is uh, for these Old Testament stories of Israel. Why are they left for us to, to read and to, and to learn from today? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul reminds the Corinthians of what Israel went through in the wilderness. Uh, and their journeys and, and what they experienced from God and also their unfaithfulness. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. These things occurred as examples to us, to, as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Joshua chapter 4 is recorded for Christians so that we may learn from Israel's example. And so tonight I'm going to preach the example from this passage that we need to learn from. That's how I'm going to look at this chapter. So let's read Joshua chapter 4 and and see what it is. So please open up a Bible and uh, follow along. Joshua chapter 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan... The Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people. Just as Moses had directed Joshua, the people hurried over. 
And as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they revered him all the days of his life, just as they had revered Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the, Jordan, out of the river carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran in flood as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken up out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you may always fear the Lord your God. These are the words of the Lord. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. Let's pray and ask God for his help as we unpack this. Our Father, we come before you through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time that we can set aside, that we can hear your word. Father, you know that we cannot gather yet. You know that we are apart. And Lord, we long to be together. Please, may you work things out so that we might be able to gather together again, that your people might be able to come alongside one another, fellowship, to worship together as your church. But Father, until then, we just thank you that we still have opportunities like this, though it's not the same, to hear your word, to be instructed by you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be working. Please take your word Cause us, cause us to see it, to understand, comprehend it, and then give us the desire, put the conviction within us to obey it. I pray for every person tuning in now that they would hear and obey the instruction that you have given us in this passage. May Christ be lifted up. May your people be strengthened and refined. And may any who are lost be converted. For Jesus' name's sake we pray. Amen. Well, chapter 4 is really divided into, into thirds. Uh, the first third of the chapter focuses on uh, Israel remembering this, this event, the significance of this event. The middle section uh, retells in a bit more detail what the crossing look of the Red Sea, look, uh, of the Jordan River looked like. And the final third goes back again and reinforces the significance of the event. This is the primary focus of this passage, and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time. So firstly, I want us to see the memorial that God sets up. The memorial that God sets up. And look at verses 1 to 3 with me, just quickly. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So here, this, is, this command is given straight after they finish crossing. You see that in verse 1. And there is to be a response to the crossing, a response to this miracle. So what's the deal with these 12 men and the 12 stones? Well, each man represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And therefore, each stone they held represented the 12, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. 
So why were they to pick up the stones out of the Jordan and bring them to the side where Israel had crossed over to? What was the point of that? Well, verses 6 and 7 tell us. These stones are to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See, these stones would have functioned as a memorial for Israel forever. Now, why did the Lord deem it necessary that this memorial site was set up? Well, in answering that question, why do we build memorials today? Lest we forget, right? That's the point of a memorial. Can you imagine if the next generation uh, to come after us forgets about, uh, forgot about Gallipoli? Can you imagine if the generation to come completely forgot about the Holocaust? That would be unthinkable. And, and we do things to ensure that that can never happen. We set up memorials. We have war memorials. There is a memorial at the site where the World Trade Centers once stood for the, to commemorate the, the, the victims who died there, to remember them. Now, these are memorials reflecting events that only have earthly significance, a temporal significance. What if Israel was to forget what God did through the Exodus? What if Israel was to forget how God dried up the Jordan so that they could cross from the hot wilderness and that their feet could feel the cool grass of the promised land? What if they were to forget that? Church, what if we and the next generation were to forget the great cost that God took upon himself to ransom us, the sending of his son and the death of his son? God wants to ensure that Israel don't forget what he has done, the deliverance. So he sets up, he ensures this rock memorial is set up. Notice how important it is the author repeats it and reinforces it. Look at the repetition all the way in verse 20. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that he had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them. He's repeating himself what the author already said at the beginning of Joshua chapter 4. And did you notice it says Joshua set up the 12 stones in Gilgal. He didn't just plonk the 12 stones on the other side, but he set them up. They were stacked up as a monument. The point was that they stood out. The point was that they would gain the people's attention. The point was that these rocks had a significant importance about them. You see, these 12 rocks would be a sermon for the eyes. They would be a sermon that never stopped. These rocks would be preaching 24-7. As long as they stood, they would be preaching. And it says that they were set up at Gilgal. That was the other side of the Jordan where the Israelites crossed. And this memorial is set up at Gilgal for Israel and for their future generations. But why this memorial? Why the need for it? Because we are fallen sinners. And one of the devastating fruits of our sinful nature is forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. And this ends up, as you continue to read through the Old Testament, the sin of forgetfulness becomes one of Israel's great ongoing sins in the history. Let me give you a few examples. There's so many Judges chapter 3, verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Ashtaraz. Hosea chapter 2, verse 13. Israel adorned herself with ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Psalm 78, 10 to 11. Even more relevant to our passage. 
Israel did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. Over and over and over, there are passages saying how Israel forgot their Lord. So God here condescends to help with their sinful weakness of forgetfulness and to help them remember him. He has them establish this memorial site to always remind them. How helpful is it having a memorial set up? Well, what happens when you take your children to a memorial center? Or what happens when children uh, uh, go on an excursion to a memorial site? What happens? Children ask questions. And when they ask questions, it enables their parents or their teacher to, to give them information, to instruct them, to teach them. And it allows and gives opportunity for a great discussion We'll look at, cha- at verse 6 and verse 7 again. Look, the stones are to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. The point of a memorial is... When your children see and when they ask you, what does it mean? Tell them. Tell them. They'll see, they'll ask questions and tell them. Who is asking in this and who is teaching? Well, verse 6 says, when your children ask you. And look at verse 21. It says, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers. Now that word in the Hebrew, descendants, is the same as in verse 6. It literally means children. It's the same word. When your children ask you, when they ask you. My question is, who has the primary responsibility of teaching children about who God is, what he has done, what his word says in its entirety? Who has that primary responsibility? It's not Pastor Ian. It's not Pastor Will. It's not Kathy. It is parents. God has always designed it to be this way. God's design has always, has always been for parents to devote themselves to teaching their children the word of God. It's always been like this when you read, when you read the word. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. God says to them, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Deuteronomy 11, 19. Teach these words of mine to your children talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Parents are to be teaching their children each day at different points of the day. And Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. How many times have we read Proverbs chapter 1? But listen to verses 8 to 9. It says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Parents, parents have the great responsibility to diligently, diligently teach their children God's word daily. Parenting is a full time ministry and the problem is it often isn't called a ministry gems is called a ministry rocks is called a ministry sunday school and youth group are called ministries but rarely is parenting called a full-time ministry the bible repeatedly emphasizes the need for teaching by parents that parents are to teach their, their children the word of God. But what has happened? What, what, what's gone on? How, why has this faded away? Why has this lost ground in, in, in Christian homes? Well, the rise and evolution of Sunday school and youth group. 
You see, going back just 50 years ago, Sunday school was focused at outreach, picking up children in the community who didn't come to church and bringing them to church. And Sunday school was for outreach, but also for teaching the church kids. But what happened? As life got busier, as family life got busier, as women began to become more uh, venturous into the workforce, family life was diminished and the primary responsibility of teaching children the Word of God was handed over and given to Sunday school ministry. Sunday school embraced the responsibility of primarily teaching children the Scriptures. And the same happened with youth group. Parents prioritized work commitments. Both parents, it became more common to enter the workforce. Life got much more busier and parents handed over the responsibility of their children's spiritual growth and their children's understanding of the word of God to youth groups. And, and, and so the transition was children went from daily hearing the word of God from their parents to hearing it once a week from a young man who's been trained in seminary or college. And, and, and you hear, even today, you hear parents say things, even today, say things like this, well, I'm just glad that my children go to youth group. I'm just happy that we have a Sunday school for our kids that they can go to. And others will say, our kids are good, uh, they go to a Christian school. The responsibility that was given to parents to be the primary teachers of the Word of God has been now taken up by ministries. It's been given to ministries. And parents are not victims in this. They are not victims to this change. Parents have handed over the responsibility of teaching their children daily the word of God and they've handed the responsibility to the ministry professionals. That's who they've given it to. Now, I'm not, I'm not, understand, I'm not denouncing Sunday school. I am not denouncing youth group. But these ministries are meant to support and reinforce what parents are already doing in the home with their children. They're not designed to make up for what Christian parents aren't doing. That's, that's, that's the point here. And so, parents... If you're listening, based upon the clear teaching of the Bible that we have just seen, let me ask you, do you have family worship at home with your children? Parents, do you daily read the Word of God, teach your children the Word of God, sing with your kids about God, and pray with them on a daily basis? Are you doing that? Let me get a little bit more specific on, on, on this. The main responsibility of teaching our children the word of God, it falls on fathers. The main responsibility is on fathers. Look at verse 21. Joshua said to the Israelites, In the future when your children ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them. Tell them what the Lord has done. The primary responsibility of a children knowing the scriptures and being taught them daily falls upon fathers. And this is consistent with the New Testament. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 6 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, you are the head of the home. Fathers, you are the family shepherd. That's who you are. And you must ensure that your children are taught the word of God, that they are being taught sound doctrine. You must ensure that. And now, just for an example, some fathers are extremely, extremely, extremely busy with work. Extremely busy with work. 
Those kind of fathers must ensure that they are working so closely with their wives that they know that they know that they know that their wives, they're equipping their wives, helping and supporting their wives to ensure that their wives are teaching the children when they aren't home. Need to be working closely with your wife. And so I, I, even here, I appeal to every single father listening tonight, every single one of you listening, do not expect your wife to pick up the mantle that has been given to you by God. Every father listening, do not palm off to Sunday school the responsibility God has given to you to teach your children God's word daily. Every father, do not palm off to Sunday school, to youth group, the responsibility that is yours to teach your children the word of God daily. By the mercies of God, I urge you, I urge you, Fathers, even if you have neglected this for many, many years, many, many years, it's not too late now. It's not too late. Now, whether you have infants or whether you've got teenagers, start now. Even if you've now become a grandparent, Pour, pour time into your children who have children of their own now. Encourage them, equip them, come alongside them to ensure this is happening. Fathers, if you have neglected this for a long time, then, then confess your sin to God. Repent before God. And I assure you, there is mercy available from our Heavenly Father. Come before Him and He will be merciful to you. And now, fathers, start. Start. Take this on now. Now. There is mercy and grace at His throne. Preachers, we know, and teachers, preachers and teachers will receive a strict judgment. James 3 tells us this. But understand, parents will be held responsible for whether or not they diligently taught their children the Word of God daily. Parents, you must see this. You must feel the weight of this from the Scriptures. You need to. So how, how, how could you cultivate this? Parents, father or mother listening, when you hang around, when you meet with other, other mothers or when you meet with other fathers, encourage each other, talk to one another, ask each other, what do you do for family worship? What are you working through at the moment? How are you going through the Bible? What songs are you singing with your kids? What time of the day do you do it? What does it look like? Support each other. If you don't have kids encourage and come alongside those who do make sure this next generation of children are hearing the word of God that parents are feeling equipped and being supported and encouraged to do this and if you're if you're a teenager even now or younger and you're listening and you're at home even now ask your parents we haven't been doing this can we start now there is application for everyone here can we start this now well, God wants to make it clear that his salvation and his work is never to be forgotten. It's never to be forgotten. So he has Joshua set up this rock memorial so that it would lead to remembrance. It'll lead to teaching the children. But Israel aren't the only ones, aren't the only ones who are prone to forgetting what God has done. He, you read the Old Testament and he gives them so many different memorials. There's heaps of them. Do a Bible study on it to help them remember what he has done. But they're not the only ones that are prone to forgetfulness. We too have the same sinful natures that they have, and we too are prone to its, the sinful nature's weakness of forgetting what God has done. And so my question is, if, is, if, if memorials were necessary for Israel uh, in order for them to remember what God has done, then isn't it necessary for Christians to have memorials so that they can remember what God has done? Don't we need them too? Well, we as Christians do have memorials that we hold to to help us remember. What are those memorials that we have? Well, two, two of them, Christmas, 
where we come together to remember Jesus' birth coming into this world. We preach and teach on it and then celebrate it. And the other memorial is, uh, is Easter, the East, Easter weekend, Good Friday and Sunday, where we remember Jesus' death and resurrection and we teach on it and we celebrate it. What's interesting about these two memorials is that they were established by us, not God. They are good, but God didn't establish these memorials. We did. And so can I be so bold as to say that these aren't the most important memorials given to us as Christians? That the most important memorials given for Christians are the ones that were established by God, not by us. What are the two memorials established by God for Christians? The Lord's Supper and baptism. These are two that he has established. Remember, memorials are visual reminders. Memorials are for the eyes. Think about it. The Lord's Supper. We remember Jesus in communion. We remember Jesus who was crucified, who died for us. The Holy One who died for wicked. We remember in the Lord's Supper the unbreakable covenant that we have been brought into by his blood. And we remember in it that he is coming back for us. We remember it is a memorial. Remember, Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus sets up this memorial for every future generation. And so we have it even now. What about baptism? The other, the other memorial that God's given us. This is a public, visible sign of God's salvation in the life of an individual. And God has given us this enduring ordinance to be kept for every single generation. We baptize every single person that turns to faith and put, turns from sin and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. We baptize every single one. Jesus sets up this ordinance for every single generation. This reminder, this thing that we, that we do of, to show his salvation. So what did, we say, what did we say the purpose of a memorial is? It's two things. To be a visual reminder of what God has done and to ensure that future generations remember what God has done. Remember, the memorial is there. Children are to see it. It's to cause them to ask questions. And then that provides opportunity for parents to teach them and enter into discussion about what those memorials point to. And, and, and that twofold purpose of a memorial is true of the two memorials that Jesus has given us, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. They are to remind us of what God's done and they are to ensure that future generations also remember a visible sign for kids to see and then for them to ask questions and giving us the opportunity to teach them about it. So if this is the case, if this is God's design for these two memorials that he's given to Christians, the Lord's Supper and baptism, well, there's great application for us, isn't there? The Lord's Supper, our children must be with us when we have communion. They might be too young. They might not be fit to partake of communion, partake of the meal, but they must be with us. Our children should not be in creche. They should not be in a Sunday school. They should not be somewhere else when communion is happening. They need to see it. They need to see the memorial. Virtually every single communion service that we have, Hosea and Scarlett ask me questions during it. At the start, when they first saw it, they were asking, Daddy, what's this? Daddy, what's this? What are you doing? But then as they begin to see it more and more, they would ask other questions. Daddy, why are you closing your eyes? Daddy, what are you praying about? What are you thinking? What are you doing? What's going on? And when they did that, even though that, that point in the service is a sober time, I did not tell them to shush and ask the questions later. Why not? Because in verse 6 and 21, Joshua says, when your children see the memorial and ask you, what does this mean? Tell them. 
Tell them, parents, you must bring your children to Gilgal to see the memorial. They must see the Lord's Supper happening. And so even more application, you must be careful to guard your attendance of communion services when they happen. Do not prevent them from seeing these important memorials, these reminders and these teaching opportunities. What about baptism? Well, here at CHBC, the majority of our baptisms happen at the 5 p.m. service. Now, I've only been here for a couple of years, um, but I've heard even before I was here uh, that baptisms each year are rare and few. When we have baptism, parents, when we have those services, do you bring your children? Do you bring them with you? Are they here with you to see the baptisms? Are you bringing them along or are you preventing them from coming to Gilgal and being reminded and seeing and being taught what God has done? Parents, your children must come to Gilgal and see baptisms. They need to be here to see these visuals that God has given us that are tremendously important. Every parent should want to be able to say to their children, During the Lord's Supper, come and see and let us remember what the Lord has done for us. Every parent should want to bring their children to a baptism service and say, come, let us hear what God has done in a sinner's life. Come and let's see, he has done everything well. Come, let's ensure that we are there, lest we forget. Lest we forget. Do you notice also do you notice also how Josh what Joshua says we should talk about in these in the in the memorial and what our focus should be in the memorial look at verse 7 He says there tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord what's the focus of the rock memorial the hero is God the anthem is God it's all about him and what he has done look at the emphasis on God in verse 23 look at how it's all to be about God look at verse 23 look at the emphasis on God for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea. And beginning of verse 24, he did this. You see, it's all about him. It's all about God. In chapter 3 and 4, this this story about the crossing of uh, the Jordan River, 17 times the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned. The Ark of the Covenant, which symbolized and had the presence of God in there of God going with them. 17 times it's mentioned. It's all about God. The point is not the stones. The point is not the Jordan River. The point is God. It's all about him and remembering what he has done. Interesting, even the most seemingly incidental, insignificant sentence in this whole passage highlights this point. Look at verse 19, the seemingly most incidental statement in the whole chapter. Verse 19, on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. You see that calendar date there? That's no meaningless date. Rewind 40 years back. 40 years back, what happened on that same date, the 10th day of the first month? What happened? Israel are in Egypt and on that day God tells them choose lambs to kill so you can put their blood on your doorposts and so that you can celebrate Passover you will see my salvation on that day you see Israel God here that day 40 years ago God was preparing them salvation was being accomplished 40 years later salvation is being completed because they cross over from the wilderness to the promised land This is God. God is tying in these two memorials. What he did in in the crossing of the Jordan, he's tying it to what he did when they killed the Passover lamb, which was another memorial. He ties the two memorials together so that they would remember what he has done, his great salvation. Memorials are a reminder of this. The memorial was not about the stone, not about the Jordan. 
The Lord's Supper is not to point to the bread and the wine. Jesus said, whenever you eat, uh, through Paul, he said, whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's about Jesus. And when someone's baptized, it's not pointing to the water. It's to point and show us our union with Jesus in his death, burial and resurrection. It's all about him, what he has done. And so God lays this all out, the instructions for this memorial, and he commands them. But how does Israel respond? God's shown its significance. How does Israel respond? Well, this leads to our next point that I want to just be very brief on. We see Israel's obedience. Look at this. Firstly, Israel's obedience. Look at verse 8. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over to their camp where they put them down. The Israelites obey the command of God to grab the stones and bring them across. Look at Joshua's obedience in the next verse. Verse 9, Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Joshua obeys the command of God and, and does the setup. Look also at the priest's obedience in the next two verses. The priests obey too. Verse 10, now the priests who carry the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed them. The people hurried over. The priests obey. They're standing in the middle of this Jordan, bearing up the Ark of the Covenant, while a million Jews with all their children, with all their livestock, with all their possessions, slowly or, or manage their way to get across the Jordan. They, the priests could have been there standing for hours holding that Ark, but they did not move to the left. They did not move to the right until the Lord had told them. Look at the priest's obedience. And lastly, in verses 12 and 13, we see the warriors of, of, the, of the three tribes' obedience. We see in 12 and 13, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They take up their weapons and they go over first to prepare for war. This is what Moses had told these three tribes back in numbers they needed to do. And they still kept their word. They kept their word and they obey. What a wonderful example of all-round obedience. Isn't it amazing? Israelites obey. Joshua obeys. The priests obey. The three tribes, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh obey. What an example of obedience. You can almost picture God looking down from heaven at this event and saying, Well done, good and faithful servants. They obeyed him. Listener. You who are tuning in tonight, will you obey him? Even in this, I have told you what God's command is for you. I've told you what his will for you is. Will you obey parents? Will you hear the commands, God's will for your life, and will you obey them? Will you not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word? Look at Israel. They're our example in this passage. They obeyed God. You must obey his call tonight. You must. The hearing is useless otherwise. Well, last point I want us to see. God wants all of this for his glory. All of this is for his glory. And God will be glorified through this great work, this great event, and the memorial in two ways. Verse 24 shows us two ways that God will be glorified through what he has done. Look at first half of verse 24. He did this, God did this, so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. His great work, His great power, His work of salvation will cause all the peoples of the earth to know His power. You see, God's work of deliverance will be made known among the world. You see, our salvation... When God saves us as Christians, we become a testimony to the world of his power. We do. That God took a corrupt people, a corrupt mass of evil, and he made that corruption holy like his son. He took wickedness and he turned it into righteousness. By his power he did this. This is God and all the peoples of the earth will see it. How else will God be glorified? 
Look at the second half of verse 24. And so he did this so that you might always fear the Lord your God. God's powerful work of salvation, his power that's displayed is to preserve the health of his people. He demonstrated his power, his work. He did this so that his people would always fear him, that they might always fear him. God wants his people to fear him, not to cower before him, not to dread him, but to reverence him, to treat him as holy, to live every moment of their lives, every aspect of their lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy are you, God. He wants us to fear him so that we would recognize his power and be faithful to him, that we would follow him all of our days. This is what he wants. it's, It's for our health. But when his people disregard his memorials, When his people cease to tremble at his word, then his people dishonor their God. They bring dishonor to him. And his name will be dishonored among the peoples of the earth because of his church. This is what happened to Israel. This is what happened. They disregarded his memorials. They stopped trembling at his word. They no longer feared him. They brought dishonor to his name and the nations blasphemed God because of them. This is what happened to Israel. You know what's so interesting? Gilgal was once this holy place. Gilgal was once a place where you could go to remember God's salvation. Gilgal was once a place with a memorial that was to inspire true worship of Yahweh. But what happened to Gilgal? It became a place where, where God's people made sacrifices to demons. There are many verses. Let me show you one. Amos 4.4, 4, much later on, God rebukes Israel. He rebukes his people and he says this, Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Verse 5, For that is what you children of Israel love to do. So what happens. The holy place becomes desecrated. God becomes dishonored. You know, there are many churches, it's happened in America, it's happened in England, it's happened in Australia, right through history. Many churches that were once pillars of truth, cities on a hill, at one point down the track, they compromised. They compromised and they lost it. We need to hear God's word and we need to obey it. We need to ensure that the next generation of children coming through hear God's word and come to know him Our Gilgal here at CHBC, we need to be like a tree whose roots go deep, whose roots go deep so that we will not easily be moved, that we will not easily be swayed and compromised. Well, let me close. Joshua chapter 3 and 4 are restless chapters. The event is, Joshua chapter 3 and 4, they finish incomplete. And really this event is waiting for fulfillment at this point. God had his people pass through the Jordan to enter the promised land. But this wouldn't be the end for the Jordan River. The Jordan River would still have a role to play. More than a thousand years later, God would raise up a mysterious, strange figure. And God would instruct this figure to bring his people back to the Jordan River. But this time it would not be to cross the Jordan it would be to be submerged in the Jordan. This mysterious figure's name was John. And this figure called God's people to a baptism of repentance in the Jordan. He called them to acknowledge their sinfulness. And he described his ministry as fulfillment of Isaiah, to prepare the way of the Lord. And then one day that mysterious, mysterious figure John one day while he was at the Jordan River he saw the Lord with his own eyes and what did he say behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world it's all about Jesus Joshua chapter 3 and 4 it's all about getting to Jesus it's all about him listener have you taken your sins to Jesus and has he taken them away have you been forgiven through Christ parents families church Are your homes all about Jesus Christ? Are you committed to making Jesus Christ known every day to your children by teaching them God's word? Oh, may you hear the call of Joshua chapter 4 tonight. Amen. Dear Father, I thank you for our time. 
I pray that you would uh, be pleased to take these truths. Lord, let not Satan snatch them from the listening minds tonight. I pray for everyone listening, including myself, may we take, take these things to heart and may we be obedient in responding. Oh God, I pray for your mercy. Please, please cause us to, to be serious about your word, to be serious about the children, for parents to take on and embrace their responsibility of teaching God's word daily to them every day. And I pray even for those who don't have children yet, that they would be taking heed of this so that one day maybe when you grant them children, they'll be ready and committed and prepared to do this. For those who don't have children, may they be coming alongside those who do. Oh God, may the future generations coming through, may they see and be taught and remember what the Lord has done. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we close, uh, and, and the stream. Uh, I have four books here. Um, if God has been speaking to you about the subjects that we've covered tonight, um, then uh, I want to uh, suggest uh, if, you're, if you're really convicted or you're, you're really wanting to take this on board and really start implementing thing, things, can I recommend just a few books here? They'll come up on the screen so that you can get the details. Uh, firstly is a book called uh, Family Worship. Very, very small, very easy read. If you're wanting to get started to see what it looks like, this is a great little book. Also, even being specific in that, an even thinner book called How Should Men Lead Their Families. Very good book. You can read it in half an hour. Uh, uh, can I encourage you to get this? Also with what we looked at tonight, the significance of the Lord's Supper, how we can benefit from the Lord's Supper, its importance in our lives, even for future generations. This little book, How Can I Benefit from the Lord's Supper? Look how thin it is. If it's something you're interested in, uh, please follow that up or contact me. And also in conjunction with that, what we looked at, uh, Understanding uh, Baptism. Uh, another look, another great little thin book that you can get through in no ta- time. If if the truths tonight have God has impressed upon your heart, then please contact me or chase these things down. Uh, may God be glorified in us. God bless you, church. <laughs>